Hello and welcome back. In this lecture we're going, to call, we're going to cover the sense of sight. So the eyeball has accessory organs that aid it in doing its job. The eyelid is composed of four layers. It has the skin, the orbicularis oculi muscle, connective tissue, and the conjunctiva, which is a clear membrane covering the inside of the eyelid. Eyebrows are going to be there to shade eyes and prevent sweat from trickling into the eyes. Eyelashes are very sensitive and when touched stimulate the blinking reflex so they protect the things from getting into the eye. And then we have the conjunctiva which is a transparent membrane covering the sclera. This conjunctiva is continuous with that conjunctiva that's found in the inner eyelid. One of the jobs of the conjunctiva is to produce mucus and so it protects the underlying layers. It also protects the eye from drying out. Just to show you some structures of the of the accessory organs, of course we have up here the eyebrows, which are going to be pigmented. They do absorb sunlight and aid in protecting uh, sweat from dripping into the eye. Uh, we do have the eyelid. You can see at least the skin part of the eyelid there. And then underneath of that would be connective tissue, orbicularis oculi, and also the inner layer would be the conjunctiva. So uh, we do have eyelashes, which are going to be pigmented. They do absorb sunlight and aid in protecting the eye from things coming into the eye as they are very sensitive. Um, so the actual slit of the eye is called the paprebial fissure. So we can see the paprebial fissure by looking at this kind of bracketed area there. So it is a slit which opens up and allows you to have a lower eyelid and an inner eye, an, an upper eyelid. Um, we can see the shiny layer on the surface of the white of the eye. That would be the conjunctiva. So it's a shiny layer um, that's covered by, uh, that covers the sclera. And, um, you know, you can see the iris and the pupil. These aren't parts we've talked about yet, but we will get to those. Kind of in the corner of the eye, or immediately in the eye, will be the lacrimal caruncle. And the lacrimal caruncle is going to be sweat and sebaceous glands. So they do produce lubrications um, that aid in making sure the eye does not uh, dry out. So the lacrimal apparatus is another accessory structure. This consists of the lacrimal gland and then a series of ducts that lead into the nasal cavity. Extrinsic eye muscles are also accessory organs to the eyeball. So we do have six muscles that rotate the eye in various directions. These muscles are termed the superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. I'll show you an image of this in just a bit. So here's the lacrimal apparatus. If we kind of start up here in the kind of the, um, the upper lateral side of the eye, we have underneath the eyelid, really underneath in between the eyelid and eyebrow, will be the lacrimal gland. It has a series of ducts that are going to basically take its secretions and lubricate the eye. There is a flow of the secretion across the eye, and then basically it comes down to these little holes here. Um, each hole is called a lac lacrimal uh, punctum. So you can see one of the holes here, and then one of the holes right here. These holes are going to drain the tears from the eye. They'll go down these little ducts here called the lacrimal uh, canal canaliculus, and then all the secretions will dump into the nasolacrimal duct and eventually drips into the nasal cavity. So if you have a lot of very strong tears in the eyes, you're going to basically drip the drip um, basically out of your nose. So heavy crying will take those tears to the na nostril and they will drip out. Here's some of the eye muscles. This is a lateral view, just showing you some of the various muscles of the eye. So we have the inferior rectus here at the bottom, inferior oblique. We have the lateral rectus. Rectus means straight across. We have the superior rectus and then the superior oblique in this particular drawing. From a, uh, from a superior view, you, you can see the superior oblique, you can see the medial rectus, you can see the lateral rectus, and then we have the inferior rectus, and then superior rectus um, are the muscles you can see in this particular view. 
each of those muscles are going to grab a hold of the eyeball in a different way to be able to rotate the eye and allow it to do all the different directional um, rotations that it can do. Um, just to refresh your memory, we did study cranial nerves. So if you notice, the abducens is going to control the lateral movement of the eye. So the eye to side to side movement will be done by abducens. The trochlear nerve is going to control the eye when it moves medially and then laterally. So as you're kind of looking at something coming towards you very close to the tip of your nose, that downward medial and lateral um, inferior kind of rotation is going to be controlled by the trochlear nerve. And as you can see, all the rest of the movements are going to be controlled by the oculomotor nerve. All right, so we're going to go into the eyeball now, and we're going to look at various parts of the eyeball. We're going to notice that kind of on the outer edge, we have the fibrous layer. The fibrous layer is going to be made of a clear structure called the cornea, and then it's going to be made of an, uh, a st structure of dense regular connective tissue that's called the sclera. Notice that the sclera goes around and makes up the globe of the eye. It's a very tough structure, so it's very hard to penetrate into that part called the sclera. And we're going to see that there's going to be kind of a middle or vascular layer. It's made up of the color portion of the eye, which is a series of muscles called the iris. It's made up of muscles and other tissues called the ciliary body that's going to control the shape of the lens. And then it's made of a middle layer called the choroid layer. The choroid layer is going to have blood vessels in it that are going to nourish the inner layer of the eye called the retina. And then we have the inner layer of the eye. Um, so we do have the retina, which is the neural part of the eye. And then we have behind that, we have a pigmented epithelium, a pigmented layer um, of, of epithelium that's going to absorb excess amounts of light. So we'll cover each of these different layers through the course of this remaining lecture. All right. So the fibrous or outer layer is made of the cornea. This is a clear portion allowing light into the eye. It does not have blood vessels, so it has to be fed by the liquid part of the eye that's right underneath of it. Um, but it is clear. It has clear proteins that allow light to move in. The shape of the cornea is really important at focusing the light coming in. And if you have a misshapen cornea, oftentimes you have to have contact lenses or glasses, or you have to have the radial keratotomy surgery, which reshapes your cornea to the correct position to allow you to see clearly. The sclera, as I mentioned before, was the white portion of the eye, <coughs> and it makes up kind of like the, the globe of the eye, the outer portion of the eye. It's made of a very tough connective tissue um, and does a very good job of containing the eyeball. So the middle layer is also known as the vascular layer, and it's made of the choroid. The choroid is uh, basically blood vessel rich, it has many melanocytes in it, which produce melanin, which can absorb excess amount of light in the eye, so it doesn't um, reduce the ability for you to see clearly. We also have in the vascular layer the ciliary body. This is a group of ciliary processes, and also it's made of muscle tissue. Um, this muscle tissue forms a circle around the lens and can change the shape of the lens depending upon if the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system stimulates it. The lens is also part of this middle layer, this middle vascular layer. This is a clear structure made of crystalline proteins, um, and it's going to focus the light so that it hits the right part of the retina for nice, clear vision. Just to show you some of the structures we've talked about so far, so we have talked about the ciliary, um, ciliary body, which is this structure right here. Um, these are ciliary processes, which are going to basically be attached. They're parts of muscle that are going to be attached to all these little strings right here, or these suspensory ligaments, which are attached to the lens. Um, these are going to aid in essentially controlling the shape of the lens. The ciliary process also produces an aqueous humor, which is a fluid that fills uh, two of the chambers of the eye. All right, so looking at some of the structures we've talked about so far, we have the cornea, which is on the outer edge, and it's clear. We have the sclera making up the bulk of the globe of the eye, 
containing all the eye structures or eye parts. Going into the um, into the middle layer, we have the choroid. The choroid is going to um, be the structure here, and the choroid is rich in blood vessels, as you can see in this diagram. It's going to feed the retina that uh, is over top of it. We also have, of course, the iris, which is the color portion of the eye, and it's made of, of a series of muscles which control the size of the pupil. The pupil basically is a hole that allows light to go through to be sensed by the eye. We also have in the middle layer, or that vascular layer, the ciliary body, which is a series of muscles and a series of parts that create fluid that's going to fill the chambers of the eye. Now your eye shape is pretty important. So this is a normal shaped eye. And if you notice, light rays coming in are going to be focused by the cornea and the lens to a specific spot, okay? which is where you have the clearest vision. It's called the fovea centralis. This is where we have the clearest vision. And notice that all the light rays are being focused, that is harvested, so they all basically are bent and intersect very clearly at that fovea centralis, or our clearest point of vision. Notice that it strikes the specific part of the back of the eye. It's nice and clear. So this is what we call the focal point of the retina. That's if you have a normal shaped eye. So if you have an eye that creates nearsightedness, that means that the light rays, when they come into the eye, because your eye is either misshapen, your cornea is misshapen, or your lens is not working correctly, we're going to focus the light way in advance to where your fo clear focus is created by the retina. So here the eyeball is too long, and if it's too long and you have your focal point here before it gets to the retina, then you're going to have basically blurry vision. Now we correct that by having a corrective lens. Now you can correct, uh, you can have a corrected lens by using glasses, or you can have uh, uh, essentially a contact lens that covers over the cornea. Either way, this corrective lens or the or the the uh, the uh, contact lens that you put over the cornea. This is going to re-angle um, the way light's coming through so that now it heart is going to be focused on the back of the eye where your very clear, clear quiz, crisp vision is, is created. So essentially you're correcting the light rays going through a misshapen eye. For people that are farsighted, that means your eye is basically kind of more uh, short, and so the focus point of the light is behind the eye, which means you're not going to have clear, clear crisp um, vision. So we have a lens that will correct that so that the light is going to focus in this right location. Again, we can have corrective lenses for the, um, for the cornea. We can do radial keratotomy surgery as well to correct the shape of the cornea. Now we were talking earlier about the ciliary um, body having muscles. So those muscles are located right here. So um, when the ciliary muscles are relaxed, the suspensory ligament is what we call taut. And that means the lens is going to be kind of more flat and thin. And that's going to be used for our distance vision. And this is under the tone, uh, under sympathetic tone or under the control of the sympathetic nervous system. So distance, when you think distance, you're thinking sympathetic nervous system. So if we want to take and look at something close, we have to take and contract the ciliary muscles. This is going to make, in the way that the muscles are arranged, it's going to make the ligaments relaxed. This is going to allow the lens to bulge. And this is going to be for close-up vision. This is done under parasympathetic nervous stimulation. So when you look at something that's really close up, you have to use sympathetic nervous, sympathetic nervous stimulation so that the muscles contract, and therefore the lens is nice and thick. Now vision's kind of interesting. When light goes through a, um, through a lens, um, the light is going to be basically flipped upside down, and it's going to be reversed. So if you take a look at this image here, you can see that the yellow is going to, as it goes through the prism, the light is flipped upside down and it's going to be reversed 
so that the light that was over here on this side now is upside down and is on the opposite side. So that's pretty complicated, but the brain has figured out a solution to that. It's, it knows how to re-invert the image um, when it processes the information back in your brain. So just another way of looking at it, when we look at distance objects, so when we look at distance objects, the ciliary muscles are going to be relaxed, which keeps these taut, which keeps the lens in the right position, and it's going to focus the light correctly in the back of the eye. And that's under sympathetic nervous stimulation. Under parasympathetic nervous stimulation, when you have something that you're looking at close up, then the ciliary muscles are going to be stimulated to contract, which is going to leave the lens oblong or more kind of fat, which will then allow for the light coming in to be harvested in the correct part of the eye. That again is under parasympathetic nervous stimulation. Now remember, an image is upside down and reversed, and that's been shown in the last two images. So the iris is also part of that, uh, that middle portion, and it's a color portion of the eye. It consists of, uh, of essentially smooth muscle tissue, and there are two major sections of smooth muscle tissue. So we essentially have a, an inner portion of the smooth muscle tissue, so you can see the sphincter uh, pupillae are the inner portion, and they are circular muscles, so they're a sphincter muscle. So they're, they go in a circular direction. And when the muscle is contracted, the pupil size will decrease, and you'll get essentially a pinhole size pupil, a very small pupil. That's under parasympathetic nervous stimulation. Okay, So under sympathetic nervous stimulation, we have a different set of muscles, the pup uh, dilator pupillae muscles um, are going to contract, and when they contract, they're going to grab a hold and make the pupil larger, so the pupil size will increase. So if you ever get stressed out, the pupil will increase in size. If you go out in the dark, that'll be stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, and the pupil size will get, will get bigger. When you're relaxed, and when you're outside or under bright light, then the pupil size will diminish or decrease in size. So the iris has a hole in the center. We call that the pupil. The iris controls the size of the pupil, and it's either going to be under parasympathetic or sympathetic nerve stimulation. So the inner layer consists of the retina. The retina is a pigmented layer. It helps to absorb light. And uh, there's also a neural layer, which contains photoreceptors, which sense photons of light. We also have a series of neurons. One of the major ones is bipolar neurons. And we have ganglion cells, which will connect the photoreceptors and bipolar cells. The ganglion cells will connect it back to the brain. The fovea centralis is the portion of the retina with the greatest concentration of photoreceptors. This gives us that clear, crisp, sharpest vision. We also have a portion of the back of the eye called um, a portion of the retina which lacks photoreceptors. This is where all the ganglion cells are collecting information and then carrying it back to the optic nerve, and this is called our blind spot. So this is an image showing you some of the things we just discussed. So we do have a pigmented layer back here, which absorbs excess amounts of light. We have then the neural layer, which is made up of the photoreceptors here in the, uh, in the uh, deeper part of the retina. We then have a series of bipolar neurons and some other neurons which connect to ganglion cells. All of these ganglion cells will carry information through the optic nerve, um, and that's cranial nerve number two, that'll carry information back to the brain. Okay, so we do have a place where all these ganglion cell um, ner neuro uh, nerve processes or axons um, all collectively collect together, and this portion has no... Um, photoreceptors. So you can see there's no photoreceptors in this region. So essentially that's a blind spot in your in your uh, in your vision. Uh, we do have of course blood vessels coming in. You can see there are arteries coming in and veins going out. Um, this is a very 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 um, important area of the of the um, of your body in terms of having blood flow. So these cells must have blood flow in order to maintain normal health. To detect a blind spot <laughs> you can take and um, you can look at a strip of paper which has a plus and a minus, and in lab 
we'll be doing a blind spot test so you can test to see that you have, actually have a hole in your vision. So going back to that um, to the neural part of the uh, eye, so let me go ahead and go over the layers with you. The sclera is the outer portion of connective tissue. We then have a middle layer of blood vessels called the choroid layer or choroid coat. We do have pigmented epithelium with melanocytes that absorbs excess amount of light. And then we have our photoreceptor layer. So this photoreceptor layer is made of rods and it's made of cones. This is a cone because it looks like a cone. This is a rod. It's more of a rod shaped uh, structure. So the rods are really super sensitive to light and this gives us our night vision. Uh, it gives us the ability to see shades of gray and white. Um, the cones are going to give us color vision. So they're used um, more in uh, when we're in, uh, during the daytime and they give us all of our color vision. You can see that the rods and the cones are going to be connected to these uh, various kinds of neurons which are going to connect down to the ganglion cells. So all of this information is processed and then carried to ganglion cells. All the ganglion cells carry information about what we're seeing uh, essentially to the optic nerve and then to um, and, and then to our brain so we can process the information. Um, it's kind of cool, but light has to go through the nerve fibers. It has to go through all of these nerve cells and then it goes through the photoreceptors and it's at the base of the photoreceptors where light is sensed. Once light is sensed, then we have electrical information, or you can think of it in terms of, you know, the nerve cells will be stimulated to send neurotransmitters to the next cell, which stimulates neurotransmitters to be sent to the next cell, and then the information goes to the brain through the optic nerve. This is just what it looks like under the under uh, histology or histological view of it. So this is the choroid layer back here. We then have the rods and the cones, the pigmented epithelium. Then we have a series of nerve cells. And then we have the ganglion cells that are going to harvest the final information and carrying it to the optic nerve and to the brain. Just one more time, we have rods and we have cones. Rods don't give us crystal clear um, um, vision. They give us a very fuzzy vision. Um, oftentimes they give us what we call peripheral vision. It's not a real crisp vision, um, but it is very super, they are very super sensitive to light and it's the kind of vision you'll be using at nighttime. Notice that they have, um, you know, all of these rods are going to be using uh, a collection of cells and then one ganglion cell. So they're not really, you know, crisp visions not being created by it. But if you look at cones, they have a one-to-one -one uh, you know, contact with ganglion cells. So they're much more crisp and clear and not fuzzy because they don't share neurons when they send information back to the brain. Just showing you a few images of, um, of what the eye looks like through an ophthalmoscope. So this is the back of the eye. So if you use an ophthalmoscope and look through the pupil, this is what an uh, ophthalmologist looks at when they look at the back of your eye. This is called the macula. It's an area, a dark area back here. And at the very center of the macula is the fovea centralis. That's where we have the highest concentration of cones, which is our, which creates our clearest, sharpest vision. Here you can see the optic disc, which is where all of the ganglion cell um, nerve fibers are going to the back of the eye and out through the optic nerve. So we have no photoreceptors there. That creates a blind spot. Of course, you can see blood vessels that are all throughout, and you can see it's nice and clean. There's no, you know, exudates or microaneurysms or bleeds or hemorrhages that are in this nice, clean eyeball. Um, I wanted to show you what a retinal tear looks like. So if um, sometime you ever get hit in the head, the, uh, the rods and cones can be torn um, off the pigmented epithelium. And this is what a retinal tear looks like if you look at it through the ophthalmoscope. And this is what a full-blown detachment looks like through an ophthalmoscope. Okay, so that's kind of interesting to look at. And um, diabet diabetic retinopathy is a very, very, very common um, uh, condition where it damages the back of the eye. So having high blood sugar and diabetes um, will basically cause you to have 
uh, all different kinds of problems in the back of the eye. One of the problems are little bleeds. Are called, they're also called microaneurysms. So having high blood sugar will leave the blood vessels very sensitive to opening up. You may actually have full-blown large hemorrhages where you leak blood into the eye. Of course, that covers over the photoreceptors and damages the eye, so you will lose vision. Uh, and then you can have exudates, which are basically collections or deposits that come out of the blood vessels and collect around the portions of the eye, and they will um, essentially block um, vision. So this is a very serious condition, the, uh, the uh, retinopathy cr created by diabetes. So keeping blood sugar under control will help diminish the, uh, the, the damage to the eye and, and thus diminish blindness that can be created by that. So we also have chambers in the eye. We have an anterior chamber which contains uh, a fluid called aqueous humor. Um, this is a fluid that nourishes and oxygenates the cornea and the lens. Uh, the cornea and lens do not have blood vessels because if they did, they wouldn't let light in uh, as easily. So the posterior chamber contains uh, a kind of a jelly-like material called the vitreous humor. The jelly-like material helps to support the internal structure of the eye so that it doesn't collapse and it will help maintain the correct shape. Just showing you an image of how um, the uh, aqueous humor is created. So we have the ciliary body is going to have tissue in it that creates the aqueous humor. The aqueous humor will flow out. It flows to the anterior chamber through the pupil. And then once it's in the pupil, it will flow out of this scleral venous sinus, also known as the canal of Schlem. And that goes to venous, uh, venous uh, flow of blood. Okay. So we also have the ciliary body will produce the aqueous humor, which goes to the posterior chamber. So to make sure everything is nice and oxygenated and nourished with that fluid. All right. So that uh, covers the chambers and how the fluid flows through. Last thing I'll just cover is, is how, um, how, uh, uh, light is basically or, or sensed and then how it's sent to the back of the eye. So if we take a look at the right eye, Notice that the right eye will gather information from the from um, the visual field that's on both the right side and uh, also the left side. Okay, so that information is sent to the brain. Uh, it will go back through the optic nerve. So at the optic chiasma, part of that information will cross over and go to the opposite side of the brain. Part of that information will actually stay on this side go to the thalamus. At the thalamus, it will then be sent to the occipital lobe. The same thing occurs on the, uh, on the opposite eye. So the visual field is split. So part of our visual field is sensed on the left eye in this portion. Part of the visual field is sensed over here. And when that information is sent to the brain, it's split. Part of it goes to the opposite side. Part of it stays on the same side. All that information goes to the thalamus. The thalamus will send the information to the occipital lobe where the vision will then be interpreted. And this is just a gross structure looking at it from a cadaver. So we do have optic nerves coming in. We have the crossing of the optic nerves at the optic chiasma. So we then have the optic tract carrying information back to the thalamus. And then we have nerve fibers carrying it down to the occipital lobe. Okay, that uh, that uh, concludes this little video on uh, a little bit on eyes. Uh, we talked, we covered the uh, the accessory structures, we covered the internal structure, and covered a little bit about how vision is uh, are sensed and sent to the back of the brain. All right, we'll see you next time in the next video. We'll be covering hearing and equilibrium.